So, but hopefully I can entertain you a little bit. I also have brought some, some live demos to make it a bit more interesting. Um, but also a lot of information how to avoid the, the most uh, difficult, nasty things in single page applications. So I will show uh, some risky things not to do and um, yeah, most of the time I show you how to avoid these things. So, so if you leave this session today, so, so you should have learned how not to do the same mistakes in your own single page applications when developing these JavaScript things. So let's start. So one slide about me, just fast. I'm Andreas Falk, uh, coming from Germany. You might recognize from my English accent. Um, I'm located in the south of Germany with a small IT consultancy, around 300 people. Um, you can reach me via Twitter, uh, via email if you have questions afterwards. Um, and I, I'm always keen for, for security in all fields, so that's why I'm not only doing application security, I'm also deep into identity management, access management, that's why I'm also uh, attending the Open ID Foundation in addition to the uh, Open Web Application Security Project. So, so to today we will talk about uh, building JavaScript applications running in your web browser. Um, and this already uh, sums up the, the biggest problems we have when we are creating single page applications. Um, so it's the most popular client type we are developing nowadays. So, so we rarely see uh, Spring MVC, Timeleaf, Vardin, uh, Java server faces now being developed. Um, but more and more we, we develop in, in single page application frameworks like Angular, React.js, Vue.js. Um, so I'm coming from a backend uh, perspective. Uh, I'm mainly a backend developer also doing front end. So, so please apologize if I don't know the latest and greatest in all the great uh, single page application frameworks. But at least security wise, I'm very deep into all that stuff. Um, so, so every day you have a new framework coming up in, in the JavaScript world. So that's much more stable in the backend world. So, so you don't get a new Java version each day. So um, it's the most popular client type, but in the same time, it's also the most problematic uh, client type uh, that you can have security wise. Um, because it runs under the control in your web browser completely. So as a developer, as, a, uh, as a, some uh, operations team that, that operates a, a server on your landscape, you don't have any control over the, the browser that is running on the machine of your customer. And your application runs totally inside that web browser. So the, the, the customer can install extensions, plugins in the web browser that also might attack your application. Um, so it, it cannot hide any secrets. So it's a really bad idea to, to, to develop uh, things like authentication inside your client because every developer, every customer could just open up the dev tools and, and see that secret already. And it's also no secure browser storage available. So, so local storage, session storage uh, can be broken by just one uh, cross-site scripting attack. And then you could probably read the complete storage with all the tokens, all the uh, secret stuff inside. Um, I'll approach that uh, risky things uh, using the, the OWASP top 10. So, so who knows the OWASP top 10? Ah, it, it gets more and more each time I ask that. Um, this is the, the latest and greatest OWASP top 10 uh, version we have, so you can just look it up at the OWASP.org website. Um, and I just highlighted the, the, the most important things. So why is it not working? No, no that, then we leave it out. Um, starting with broken access control things, then uh, the main topic will be cross-site scripting uh, injection attacks. Um, and then we will also look at uh, vulnerable outdated components, so handling all that third-party components you have in your JavaScript applications. 
Um, and then also a very important thing is authentication failures. Um, so hopefully you all already are using OAuth OpenIT Connect in your uh, single page applications with your backend applications. And the last thing is also a very important thing, so, so, so how to, to log and monitor your, your single page applications so that you uh, recognize if you're being attacked or if your your content security policies are uh, uh, not not in place as intended and stuff like that. Especially for, for cross-site scripting that just happens only on the browser, it's really helpful to have a logging available as well. So we will start with broken access control. Um, this deals with all things about authorization and stuff on your browser. So it's, it's a combination of backend and frontend tasks you have to fulfill in that place. Um, starting with the cross-site request forgery, um, who knows already how that attack is working? Ah, some of you. Um, so I've brought some, some simple um, schema how this actually is attacked. Um, on the left you have a intended business client application, so that's the one you have built uh, for your customers. And on the right side, you have a, a client application that is specifically uh, built by some attacker. Mm, so the famous uh, forum of cat pictures, for example. Um, on, and you have a REST API that deals with, with uh, storing, retrieving customer data. Um, and the most important point is here that you authenticate using a session cookie. So with stateful authentication. So that attack only works with stateful authentication with using session cookies. It, it doesn't work when you're using stateless uh, things like, like OR2 uh, tokens, JSON web tokens, stuff like that. Then this attack won't work because you don't have a session cookie then. Um, and the second thing is that a session cookie is always automatically sent by the browser if you use the same domain to send it to. So that's automatically built in inside the browser. You don't have to do anything in your application for that. And that's the bad thing for the attack here. So it will send the, the session cookie uh, as well if it's coming from your business application, but also it is sent from the attacker's application. And both can um, um, call our REST API to, to, for example, store a customer. And on the left-hand side, you, you just call the intended way of doing things on your REST API, and then the same uh, customer opens up a, another tab in his web browser and, and looks to the famous uh, forum of cats. Um, he or she loves cats and, and then clicks on the, the website and just by loading a picture, for example, on the background, it also executes that REST API call. That's only statically uh, crafted inside that cat forum. And because the session cookie is automatically being sent with that request, you're authenticated and can just also add a customer behind the scenes. Um, how to defend against that? Um, there are several possibilities to defend against cross-site request forgery. Um, so number one rule is always do not abuse the get request to modify things. Um, most frameworks uh, have built-in cross-site request forgery uh, protection like Spring Security, like Angular, like uh, uh, Axion framework that you might use for, for uh, React.js or other JavaScript frameworks have cross-site request forgery built-in. But unfortunately, this usually only kicks in for, for requests that modify resources like post, delete, put, patch things, but not for get requests because these usually are not that dangerous in, in changing things on the server. So be careful to not use get requests for modifying. Um, you could use same side cookie attributes um, to protect that, so then the origin is always checked, so if it's coming from the attacker's client, then this won't work anymore. Um, the, the, the number one mitigations you can use are the, the token-based mitigations. There are two possible ways to do that. Um, 
you have to synchronize the token pattern. Um, and especially for, for single page applications, the second one is the, 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 the most used one. So this is uh, the double submit cookie. I just show in the next slide how that works exactly. And if you have high risk security applications like banking applications, you also might use re-authentication patterns. So like you're used in your banking application, you have a pin code to authenticate, but if you want to transfer some money, then you have to re-authenticate with, with another code to do that actually. That is also a good defense protecting that here. Um, also CAPTCHAs, but CAPTCHAs are, have a horrible uh, user experience, so I would avoid that if possible. <laughs> so, so myself, I always struggle with CAPTCHAs, so, so I always think machines are my, much better to solve that CAPTCHAs than myself. So, so, so the third round with, with detecting some pictures with motorcycles and stuff like that. So this is how the double submit cookie uh, defense works. Um, so on the server side, uh, you set mainly a, a cookie, a XSRF token cookie that is set by the server side. You could use Spring Security for that. So on the bottom, you see the simple configuration you have to do for Spring Security to switch that uh, double submit cookie uh, thing on. So it's quite easy, just use that uh, CSRF token repository. Um, the important thing is that you should use the with HTTP only false. Uh, usually you should uh, switch HTTP only to true to de defend against stealing things from JavaScript. Um, but in that case, the JavaScript application has to read that cookie, unfortunately. So you have to switch that off. Um, and then the cookie is sent uh, back to the single page application and then the single applica page application just reads that cookie value and sets that for the next request as a header. And now the server can just uh, compare these two values. If they are the same, then the request is, is valid. So that's the number one uh, uh, defense against cross-site request forgery. So uh, if you have uh, session cookies as authentication. Um, when we come to the different frameworks like Angular, React.js, Vue.js, um, the world is uh, quite different. So in Angular, the CSF protection is already built in out of the box, so that's really good. Um, so if Angular detects the cookie set by Spring Security, for example, then it automatically then sends the corresponding header back to the backend. Um, but the same is not true for React.js and Vue.js. Here you are, are you on, on your own, so that's not completely built in. So you have to add that functionality with a separate framework like, like the Axios framework that also has CSF protection with the double submit cookie built in. Um, I always have provide links on the bottom to the uh, important stuff. Um, I will also provide the slides on my GitHub later and also via Twitter, so um, no problem. Um, Cross-origin sharing is a second problem with regarding broken authorization. Um, this deals about the, the same origin policy that is built inside the browsers. So if you're doing AJAX requests, then you're not free to, to just call any other domain using your AJAX requests. This is also for security precautions that an attacker could not easily load stuff from another domain via AJAX requests. Um, but usually uh, in your single page applications, you access a backend that is running on a different domain. So what to do now? So that would not, not be possible with the SOP of the browsers. So the solution is always a cross-origin resource sharing um, where you should put the correct headers on the back end, uh, like the access control allow origin or the credentials. Um, with, with these, you can control which uh, single page application can access my REST API on that domain. Um, and here the important thing is to not use the, the wildcard. And with the wildcard, you, you completely open up the, the, the protection so that each and every application could just access your REST API. Um, I often see that because uh, we 
are all developers, we are all uh, somehow lazy sometimes and, and for different testing stages, user acceptance testing and stuff like that. So it's much more easier to just put the wildcard there and then you have no problem there. Um, but especially for productive uh, stages, it is not recommended to use that pattern. So for productive, at least, uh, just always use the explicit domains that you can nail down. So usually you know your client that is accessing your REST API. So there's also OWASP security cheat sheet uh, with a lot of detail for that. Um, last thing about broken authorization is the authorization itself, so the access control. And here the, the most important message is never do that on the client side. So authentication and authorization both clearly have to be implemented on the server side always. And don't uh, just hide UI elements on the client side. That's a really bad, bad thing to do. Um, there are security tools available like OWASP SEP tool, which is a web proxy that has a button to switch on hidden elements automatically. So this thing will, will just make all visible to the attacker at once. So hiding things is complete nonsense uh, for authorization things. It's just a usability thing so that the user only sees the things he or she could do, could perform. But always do the authorization part on the server side. That, that is a big thing uh, you can do really wrong, um, especially on the server side as well. So, so that's why on the OWASP top 10 for the APIs, uh, the, the broken authorization is the number one. Um, next part is the, the main part uh, that have the risks for single page application. This is cross-site scripting. So who knows cross-site scripting already? Who has, who has seen some alert box in the application already? Well, hopefully it was not a really critical application. Um, so how, how does cross-site scripting happen uh, in common applications? Um, usually you have some, some input by the user, so, so by an input field, a URL parameter, all the sources that a user can influence by some input. Um, also, there are inputs like, like uh, yeah, different parts in your, your requests, um, uh, like the browser type and the agent and stuff like that. So you can influence various parts of the requests with your input. Um, this input is then um, going through your, your JavaScript application. That JavaScript application then uses the HTML parser. Um, and then the input comes from the source to some sync, as we name it. Um, and there are a lot of dangerous things available in the HTML world, like the famous inner HTML call. So with the inner HTML call, you advise that the browser to really render all content as HTML, including JavaScript snippets. And, and that's the bad thing. So it also picks up any JavaScript code automatically. And then the JavaScript engine executes that code automatically. So it also executes malicious code that is given by the input. So the browser doesn't care about if it's really from the application or if it's from the uh, user input. And that's how the cross-site scripting happens. And with that, you can really do bad things. You can just put in any JavaScript you like um, to break your application or to steal things. And there are three different types for cross-site scripting. Uh, the first one is reflected cross-site scripting. Um, with that, the input flows also to the backend application. And the backend application just returns the input as a reflected input. It doesn't change that input, it has no input validation in place, um, it just returns it directly and then it gets into the dangerous sync again and we have some cross-site scripting attack. Um, here it is really important that this must be handled on the client and the server side. So, so it is really good to, to put a, a drastic input validation on the server side so that that it's not possible to, to just uh, send any JavaScript snippet to the server side. So, so 
you can easily uh, um, put strict rules on that, like like uh, regular expressions or um, that the number is only up to 100, for example, and also use strong typing on the server. So don't use strings everywhere. If you expect a URL or you expect a number, then just use the corresponding type on Java, for example. So always nail it down to the, the strong typing that you just use that type that is intended. So it's a bad idea to use common strings everywhere. Um, if you use strings, then nail that down with regular expressions or with some maximum length things that also makes it more difficult for these kind of attacks. Um, you cannot do things like output uh, encoding um, on the server side. That's extremely difficult because for that you always have to know the context of the output encoding you have to do. And this, this is only known on the single page application side. So the second one is even more drastic. So it's a persistent cross-site scripting attack. Um, there you have the, the backend application and it is also stored inside the database. So, so whenever a user loads that data from the database, this is also returned back as a reflected input and comes to cross-site scripting attack. So this is more, more uh, critical because that not only uh, is for the current user reflected, um, but it's also reflected to different users. Every user who loads that from the database gets that attack. So it, uh, important is here that you also should use input validation like bean um, validation uh, on Java uh, on the data access layer as well. So also use it on your, your entity beans and stuff like that. And the last thing is the DOM-based cross-site scripting. And this is the, the, uh, the type we see most often nowadays. Um, this just happens only on the client. So, so you won't see any logs on the server side for that. You won't recognize any problem on your server side for that. So it just happens inside the client. So you get directly the source as input and directly uh, to reflect it to a dangerous sink uh, without any full regress response. Uh, So common uh, defenses against cross-site scripting are the following. Um, so, so number one is always do not put untrusted data directly into your templates. So all the frameworks like, like React.js, Angular uses some HTML templates that can also be rendered on the server with the server-side rendering stuff. And here the important thing is for rendering and, and just putting the templates uh, never use user input to craft these templates. So it's a really bad idea just to use the input and that use that input directly as a HTML template. So that would also cause uh, big problems with cross-site scripting. Um, then use strict input validation, strong typing on the server side. And on the client side, you have to put contextual output encoding in place, uh, also sanitizing Content security policies could help, so, so setting headers to, to prohibit uh, inline JavaScript completely, for example, and also only uh, permit uh, valid sources of JavaScript in external files. Um, and one thing I also want to, to talk uh, more detail about that is trusted types. So that's a... Uh, uh, quite new mechanism to, to especially defend against DOM XSS. And to protect the session cookie from stealing, just set that to HTTP only so that JavaScript cannot read that session cookie anymore. So contextual output encoding is used uh, if you want to render the content as a string in your client which is the normal case. So usually the input that you get from the user, you, you won't uh, render directly as an HTML output. As long as you don't want to implement uh, what you see is what you get editor or something like that. So usually you don't want to format these things on the web browser like bold, italic and something like that. Um, so usually you render that as a string. 
And that should be the main use case. So, so if you render it as a string, then it's quite easy to defend against the cross site scripting attacks because you just uh, encode it as HTML entity encoded uh, value, as you see, it, uh, encoded form with that, that ampersand things. And this is then only shown as textual uh, representation in the browser. So it doesn't trigger any JavaScript execution anymore. Um, the bad thing is if you want to render it as a HTML thing. So, so if you want to render the input string directly as HTML, then you need what is called sanitization. Um, sanitization means that it looks into the user input and, and gets rid of dangerous parts of that HTML snippet. So like for example here, the on error um, handler just putting out some JavaScript that is removed completely from the HTML snippet. Um, there are also quite useful libraries available. Number one is the Purify library. Um, this is a universal library for all sanitization uh, that you can use. There's also a special library for sanitizing URLs because also URLs can be crafted dangerously with the JavaScript uh, part as protocol. Um, and you also have an experimental API that is being developed nowadays um, in the browser directly. So the browsers uh, develop currently an HTML sanitizer API that is built in directly into the browsers. But that is still experimental. Um, you can just try it out on some new versions of the web browsers. Um, trusted types. So who knows trusted types already? Oh, <laughs> so trusted types is a really powerful new feature to protect against cross-site scripting, especially DOM-based cross-site scripting. Um, trusted types um, prevents it by, by locking down these dangerous uh, things directly. So if you enable trusted types in your web browser, in your application, then it is not possible anymore to... Uh, yeah, to, to, to uh, to put simple strings to these dangerous uh, things. So it's not pos possible to just put a string to, to inner HTML calls anymore. You will get a blocking error on your web browser, so this requires a trusted type typed um, thing to do that. Uh, simple strings are not allowed anymore. So you have to think over some policy how to avoid, how to sanitize this thing. So the browser... Uh, yeah, the browser uh, doesn't allow you to, to just use the strings anymore. Um, it's just uh, enabled by, by adding these header with the required trusted types for script. Um, uh, at the moment, it is only supported natively in Chrome. Um, for the other browsers, you have to install a, a polyfill that is available. But that is a really powerful uh, mechanism to avoid cross-site scripting. Um, you can see it here. Um, we have, oh, maybe I can, oh boy. so you can see it in the back. Yeah. Um, here I have uh, some uh, bad code. So I want to, to uh, uh, set inner HTML above to some nasty string with some cross-site scripting attack inside and I have enabled uh, the trusted types feature and now my browser just tells me, oh, you cannot do that, so, so fail to set the inner HTML because it requires a trusted HTML assignment. So string is not allowed anymore, it just blocks it completely, you get an error and then you have to handle it. And the good thing is that you can also set a default policy on your application um, that also handles problems in your third-party dependencies. So if you have uh, one of those bad transitive dependencies that have cross-site scripting problems inside, um, then you can also install a default policy sanitizing all the nasty stuff. And this also kicks in for third-party uh, uh, libraries that you use. So if there is a cross-site scripting problem inside a third-party library, then the default policy kicks in and tries to sanitize that as well. 
So that's also a good defense for, for other parts of your application. As we learned yesterday by, by uh, the talk in, in, uh, by Brian, I think, um, so um, of, of SNCC, and he told that that most part of the application is not your own code, most part are the dependencies. And if you have a cross-site scripting there, then it is also really bad for your application. So defenses that are built in um, in Angular are quite powerful. So, so if you use Angular, then you have built-in support for that output encoding, which is done automatically uh, if you want to render it as a text. If you want to render it as HTML or render some URLs, then also the sanitizer is built in already in Angular. So for Angular, you don't need Domperify and stuff like that. So it's already automatically built in inside Angular. Um, also, it has built-in support for trusted types since, I think, version 11 of Angular. Uh, they built in automatic support. You have a special policy called Angular for trusted types that is built in. So if you enable that trusted policy Angular with that header, then all the, the uh, automatic inner HTML things happening in Angular um, is also using trusted types automatically behind the scenes. And it also enables it completely. So if you, you try to program around uh, the APIs of Angular with direct DOM access, then you get also the nasty error uh, logs uh, prohibiting that access. So for the other uh, frameworks like React or Vue.js, um, the context output encoding is also automatically built in, but the bad thing is that sanitization is not built in. So, so be careful if you use React.js or Vue.js with HTML uh, rendering. Um, this always requires an additional sanitizer. So number one would be uh, Domporify to add to your framework calls. Um, and the good thing about Domporify is also that Domporify also supports trusted types already. Um, so instead of writing policies uh, for trusted types, you could also only use Domporify to sanitize these things and just tell Domporify don't return a string, but instead return a trusted type already. And Domporify then automatically does that for you as well, and you can just fulfill also the trusted types protection. Also, sanitize for, for URL is available. Um, and there are some traps you can have when using these frameworks. Um, like, for example, for Angular, um, you should avoid direct DOM access. With the element ref, you could just access the native DOM elements. And if you call inner HTML of, from that uh, part, um, then you have no uh, protection by Angular for that. Um, for this, kind of things you have to be sure what to do and also for this kind of things you also have to add Tumperify manually in case. And also don't deactivate the automatic sanitization so there are calls to, to DOM sanitizer bypass security for URLs, HTML, JavaScript stuff. Um, if you bypass these things the protection is switched off completely and you're on your own again. So 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 it is it, it advised recommended if you look around your source code, do some code reviews what, what you should do, um, and you recognize such a call, then you have to discuss that with the developer. So so what was the purpose to use that bypass thing? And also on the React.js, um, always use that dangerously inner HTML call with uh, with sanitization. So it's named by purpose that way, dangerously in a set HTML, so you recognize, ah, I'm doing some perhaps dangerous things here in my code. Um, also avoid direct DOM access with the find DOM node, for example, um, and also um, always sanitize the HTML rendering. It's like like in, in Vue.js, like also that inner HTML calls. Um, and lastly, um, most important thing is always, as I told, do code reviews to detect these kind of calls in your source code. And, and the good thing is also there are uh, static code analysis tools available like SonarCube or SEMGrep. 
So these pictures are from SEMGRAB uh, as a tool. Um, these tools already have some rules built, built in that also warn you about using dangerous set in, in HTML or, or bypass things in Angular. So just by checking your code, you also get these warnings. So let's show that in some demos. Hopefully it works. Um, I prepared some so demos for that. The first one would be the, the Angular playground I uh, provided here. So, so I have some, some circular page that, that uh, has used all the built-in features of Angular with uh, protection, sanitization, output encoding, stuff like that. So um, if I just uh, execute that thing, which now runs quite long. So, so as you can see here, it, it, it automatically um, uh, did some things uh, automatically. So it sanitized an unsafe URL in a value. It sanitized HTML, script some content. Um, and it also got me some, some error message that I use uh, dangerous things in my resource URL. Um, and directly you can jump to, to some, some uh, part that is, that is doing the, the, the dangerous things, like here, the, the HTML snippet. Um, and if I look at the, the code for that, um, let me just check. No, that's the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Then we have this snippet that is returned. Um, so that also has an on error inside with an alert. And this is also a warning that is seen in the, in the console browser. I also try to render these kind of things, uh, like also a safe URL that, that should be uh, working in the browser, but also an unsafe URL with a JavaScript uh, as a protocol. Um, and, and luckily, Angular handles that completely for me. Um, if I do it in an unsecure way, then uh, these things are changing. Let me just clear that. Then in the unsecure way, we already see we have one pop-up here. Hello, XSS. We have a second with noticing me that it failed to load the image, which also is a cross-site scripting attack with the on error. Uh, I have an element ref, so a direct access to the DOM uh, without protection of Angular, get another cross-site scripting attack. Um, as you can see, it, it just sanitized some content, but on the other things, uh, it just had cross-site scripting problems. Um, let me look at that code. So here we have an insecure um, variant of that application. Um, the most prominent one is uh, is that one, so I directly reference uh, a part of my, my HTML template directly with, with element ref, and then I'm doing some, some insecure things here, so, so this is my payload I just put in, um, and then I directly set payload to the inner HTML. And, and this is a thing you should not do. So what you should do, for, for example, is, is use that one um, instead, should just, uh, nah. that's the bad thing about cross-site scripting, it just kicks in all the time. So with that uh, sanitization, so we should not have the element ref anymore. So, so this has gone away, so, so the element ref XSS is not existing anymore. So that's, that's a good uh, thing if you want to use uh, use uh, that um, inner HTML of, of element refs, then always use DOM purify to, to, uh, uh, to uh, eliminate that. Um, here you can see uh, the, the string, how to, to switch on and off, returning a trusted type in DOM purify, which is also a good thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to show was uh, 
some demo for trusted types. Um, here I also have so, some input field that has some, some on error again uh, putting in here inside. Um, if I do that, then also cross-site scripting happens, um, just putting out my string here. Um, if I change that, so I can now turn on, if I'm in the correct thing here, I just turn on the the trusted types. And just look into that. Now I just uh, I cannot um, see any anything here anymore. So so um, no cross-site scripting happens anymore. So it requires now trusted HTML to kick in. So 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 it it does not work the cross-site scripting attack. And the good thing here is now you can also directly then enable some some default uh, script here with a default policy. So this now sanitizes all the, the locations automatically, uh, all the dangerous things uh, with that policy. And now if I reload, I just can call that uh, thing and, and it just renders the, the image without the, the dangerous parts. So this is the good thing about trusted types. So this was the main part of of, uh, of of risks you can have in your single page applications. So, so cross-site scripting are really the most dangerous thing for a single page application because that was the reason I have a large part uh, for that. Um, the other parts are quite small in comparison to that. So, so for vulnerable and outdated components, this is uh, can be solved quite easily by just updating regularly your dependencies uh, for your Angular, React.js and stuff. Um, um, for Angular, for example, it's, it's the easiest way is always to be on the latest version of Angular framework um, to keep it up to date. So if you update to the latest Angular, you also get fixed uh, lots of security problems automatically. And if you cannot upgrade to, to Angular to the latest version, then just try an NPM audit fix. So it fixes lots of these things automatically and just leaves some, um, some other parts that you have to fix manually then on your own. Um, authentication failures. Um, so, so who already uses OAuth? That's a good thing. So, so uh, if you're using OAuth in your single page application, don't use the implicit flow anymore. I cannot warn enough about that. So implicit flow should be completely forbidden. Uh, it's completely insecure. So, so it, it, it loads tokens via the browser URL. Everybody could just copy the token from the URL. It gets into referral headers. It, it leaks to caches, to log files, etc. So, so implicit flow in OAuth world is forbidden now. Um, instead, use always authorization code with proof key for code exchange. Um, that proof key for code exchange makes it possible so that, uh, to not store sensitive data anymore in the client side. Without that PCE Pixie addition, which is also called, um, you had to store client ID and client secret before in your client side. And a client secret is like a password, so it's not of use to store a password on the client side. Instead, with the proof key for code exchange, it, it uh, creates that uh, secret dynamically. So with each request, it crafts a new uh, secret value that it also hashes um, and, and then sends it with one request in a hashed manner and then with the second request in an unhashed uh, original manner, and then the server side just recalculates the hash again and compares these two values. If it gets the same hash result, then the requests are valid. So it, it changes from a static to a dynamic secret. So you don't have to store any static secret in the browser anymore. Um, and also use secure architecture patterns. And one big mistake I often see is that people are using the access token on the client side and the ID token on the server side, which is bad. 
So the ID token is just intended to be used on the client side. It has, it has a really reduced uh, lifetime, like for five minutes maximum, and then it cannot be uh, um, refreshed. So these are uh, the recommended patterns you should use for the things. Um, so, so this is the normal flow. Um, just using your client application with some authorization server like, like Out0, Okta, um, also from Microsoft, uh, Azure AD. Um, and then you have your backend, your resource server, and you just send a token to your backend then. So this is the normal flow you, you find everywhere. Um, the, the big risk here is that you store the token on the client side in the local or session storage. And with one cross-site scripting attack, uh, an attacker could steal just all the tokens from your client side. Um, and to avoid that is number one, avoid any XSS vulnerabilities and also limit the access token lifetime, uh, use refresh tokens and also rotate the refresh tokens. If you have a refresh token, then you exchange the refresh token to a new access token, then the refresh token should also be invalidated. So don't use a refresh token that just lasts for, for, for weeks or days and is valid for such a long time. So this is an example for scripts to just steal the complete uh, local storage. Um, for that, you have another pattern, the backend for frontend pattern, which enables the client to be completely free of tokens. So, so the client then communicates with the backend for frontend, a specially crafted uh, backend that also serves the, the single page application. Um, with, uh, that communicates with the, the same side uh, uh, secured cookie. Um, and the backend for frontend deals then with all that OAuth protocol stuff. And the tokens never leave the, the server side. So that's the most secure pattern you can have nowadays, but with the most effort, as I can also say. The last thing is security logging and monitoring failures. So you always have to know what's going on on your uh, customer's browsers. Luckily, there are also frameworks or tools like reporturi.com, uh, um, which uh, provides also insight in your client-side application. Um, like here, you can see you can have CSP reports, uh, with, with some problems with your content security policies, also with trusted types, you can have error logs automatically collected with that tool from your client side. And there are also tools like sentry.io that can also collect different kind of errors that happening on your uh, client side. As you can see on your console log, these are also then sent to the server side and uh, you can collect these in your log files. So as summary, uh, web browsers are not really trustworthy. So attacks like cross-site scripting, CSRF, are everywhere nowadays. Um, and more attacks are also possible via installed browser add-ons. Um, there is an attack video available on YouTube by, by Mika Silverman, who is also uh, at the conference. Um, he's doing some, some coding cafe, I think, today again. Um, he has uh, provided a video uh, sh showing how to, to attack using a plugin installed in the browser. Um, also collect logs and, and do not store sensitive data in, in local or session storage. And uh, to avoid these things, um, use the framework lib specific uh, protections, like for Angular. Um, consult the, the security sections for that, especially Angular has a really great section, especially for security. Same is true for Vue.js. Uh, React.js, unfortunately, does not have a specific security section, which is quite bad. So for documentation, Vue.js and Angular uh, have much more security-relevant documentation. And look at uh, provided reference of these talks and also do code reviews. Uh, and testing, and check the OWASP check, check sheets. And uh, my demos are also available at github.com, uh, so you can look it up later, and I will also provide the slides there. So I think we have time left, one minute. <laughs> so if have anybody has a question, you can also answer that. Otherwise, I will be around until Friday. Yeah. Sorry, can you go back to browser-based? Well, 
Can you first go back, please, to the browser-based apps? Uh, to the number one slide? Uh, with, no, to, with the back and for front end. Ah, to that. So, uh, is, the same, is the connection between the client and the back and for front end secure? Can't you do it, can it just be unsecured the same way? Um, you have to secure it with, with, uh, with the CSF protection as well. So, so use the, the, the token-based protection to, to CSF protection or same side cookies. And HTTPS, of course. Then it, it's secure. Because uh, you cannot steal easily cookies if it's a uh, HTTPS connection and and do, don't uh, you cannot run cross site request forgery attacks if you use same side cookies for example. Okay, thank you. So so and you have don't have tokens going uh, uh, round in that request. Thanks. So unfortunately, we are I think we have times up. So if you have any further questions, I'll stay until Friday. So, so if you catch me, then just ask me. Thank you very much.